Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Radamic. Berto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being here with us. We're going to have a great show for you today. I have three uh, fairly good size uh, intakes that I want to do. But first of all, our condolences, our condolences to the to the crew and the folks who got uh, who were killed in the implosion of that submersible today. Again. I have several thoughts about it, and you heard some of my thoughts yesterday. Bridge MCP, thank you so kindly for getting that 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 stuff from um, Rush that said the following. Uh, in an interview, he said, safety is waste. He told CBS News, you know, there's a limit. At some point, safety just is pure waste. I mean, if you just want to be safe, don't get out of bed. Don't get in your car. Don't do anything. At some point... You're going to take some risk, and it really is a risk-reward question. I think I can do this just as safely by breaking the rules. Evidently, he couldn't do it as safely by breaking the rules. I mean, you can break the rules. Listen to what Josh Gates had to say. Josh Gates, who has a show on, I think it's Discovery Channel, he went on and he said, you know what? I don't think so. I don't think so. Anyhow. Welcome aboard, Eric Hayes. Welcome aboard, Michael Rodnan, says Bridge. That's the sort of hyperbole nonsense you usually hear from libertarians. True. Eric Hayes, welcome aboard. AC Rodriguez, welcome aboard. Uh, Bridge MCP, welcome aboard, and thank you for that uh, meme. Uh, we also have in the house with us, uh, Parvet Paul Fleming, AVQ, uh, Yvette Avery Herod. How are you doing, my dear friends? John Cotter, hello, Egberto from Tokyo. Man, you are all over the place, John. Uh, well, by the way, it was fun doing some bowling. Went bowling uh, for a fundraiser with John Cotter this last weekend, and he terrorized us by, you know, he was the, I, I, I brought up the rear in the bowling. So, hey, no shame, no shame, no shame. Anyway, I got to start with our videos now. I'll continue with the chat uh, manually, but let's go ahead and get the video started because um, the first one I want to talk about is... Uh, investing in your children. I saw an article, I did this one at KPFT, but I want to do it for our audience here. I saw an article that was disconcerting to me. Invest in your kids. That's all I'm going to say. This is the outtake that I did. Please give me a, take a listen to it and then go ahead and give me a shout with your thoughts. An article appeared in my feed. I saw the same article pushed in several publications titled, We are setting them up for failure. Boomers supporting their Gen Z and young millennial children are having their retirement ruined and savings raided, which really upset me. Maybe it upset me because um, it is something that I've had to do, but with pleasure. Uh, Maybe it is something that I had to do because... We believe in this particular family unit that that is what it is, a family unit. And the family unit can be insular, grow, depending on what size it needs to be, etc. But I'm going to go there in a little bit. Not many see the implications of the article, but the article's sentiment and advice are anti-family. The instantiation uh, of the capitalist doctrine. We will cover this. And first of all, before I get started, I want those parents that are listening now who have followed their stockbrokers, who have fo- who have followed the advice of their stockbrokers, who have followed the advice of their money managers, who have followed the general advice in the tenants out there. This is not a guilt trip at all because what we have as a society has always been an indoctrination and that's not america only that's all over the world every society is an indoctrinative state uh that's just that's just how we are to some extent my parents indoctrinated me my i probably indoctrinated my daughter Because that is that, you know, indoctrination just means there's a certain set of values that don't necessarily have any scientific way of why it should be that way. But that's just how the culture develops. 
And in America, we have a cult, we have an individualistic culture. We have a culture that says more about yourself. You care about you. If you take a look at our gun debate, our gun debate is there because I want the ability to have a gun. I want the ability to do as I please. I, 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 right? You look at uh, 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 Ayn Rand, it's about not, not caring about the collective, not caring about all of us all. It's about me, me, me. Even Ayn Rand, that woman who believes solely in, in, in selfishness, even when she was on her deathbed, she depended on us all, social security. So th there's nothing called I, I, I in reality, right? We're all codependent. It's hard to accept many a times that I need you. All of us needs each other. And when we realize that we need each other and we believe in that concept, it's amazing how much better life is because no longer are we just trying to hoard for ourselves. But we haven't. We haven't gone through that yet. Right now, we're still because, again, of our indoctrination. And that's why I'm saying what I'm going to say here. Please, if you have uh, if that is the path that you take in, remember, we understand that is how we've been reared. That is how we've been indoctrinated in just about all these things that we do. Anyhow, um, I, I want to start out with the article before I get into my soapbox. The article starts out. Everyone wants the best for their kids. That's true. Most people are good people. Whenever it's ha it, happiness, health, or wealth, parents and guardians want their kids to have as an abundance of each. But at what cost to their own livelihoods? That is that that sentence immediately got to me at what cost? Everything has a cost. We understand that. But to then say that, all right, I want good for my kids. But when you say at what cost, that all automatically gives you the feel like, well, uh, you know, I want things good for my kids as long as it's good for me first. But, you know, if it's not going to be good for me, well, to hell with my kids. I mean, the sentence doesn't say that, but the implication from it thereafter, when you look at it in a different context, get what I'm saying here. Courtesy of skyrocketing rent prices, soaring inflation, student debt, and turbulent post-pandemic job market, parents of Gen Z in particular may have to support their children more than previous generations. A recent survey from Bankrate found that 68% of parents are either supporting or have supported their adult children in the past, saying as a result, they delayed their own financial milestones, retirement, paying off their own student debt, even had to take cash out of emergency savings to do what? To help or take care of their kids. And to this article's writer, who generally, uh, you, you take a look at where these articles are printed, it's generally in some sort of a financial magazine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And my thing is like, yeah, uh, increase rents, increase all these prices are higher now that we are, those who are baby boomers and Gen Xs, we never had the kind of prices to go to school and all of that that our kids have right now. When I came to the United States, I paid the highest tuition rates than anyone else because I was a foreigner my first year and I paid $40 a semester hour. When, uh, when I became a Texas resident and I got my green card and I started on the path to, to become a U.S. citizen, I became an in-state tuition in Texas and it went from $40 an hour to $4 an hour. When it was time for my daughter to go to UT, same university, her cost in real dollars was higher than my cost as a foreign student going to the University of Texas. What am I saying here? Uh, to equate what boomers and Gen Xers went through financially with what Gen Zs and millennials are going through, the kind of cost that they have relative to the kind of cost we had, it's a lot higher. 
And I want to put a little mea culpa on it on our generation. We are the ones who elected those people that believed in this supply side type economics that made, that created that wealth gap that put many of us in the situation, that put many of our kids in the situation that they are in today. So there is some mea culpa to go around why things are so expensive for them, why school costs so much for them. We are partly responsible because of those that we chose to elect, right? And yes, it may have given some of us a tax cut and a, and a little bit better. Me, 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 I, I, I. It may have given some of us a better, a, a, a marginally better life at the expense of our kids. So now that our kids need more help than we did, these consultants want you to feel guilty. And by the way, remember I said most Americans are good people? Look at what this article is saying. This article is saying 68% or so of parents are putting their retirement on hold or taking money out of their funds to help their kids. Again, most people are good. And that has a material effect on the stock broker. That has a material effect on the stock market. That has a material effect on that money manager who wants to hoard your money to keep moving up, right? If a lot of parents are starting to help their kids or it becomes vogue for you to go ahead and help your kids more so than they want you to help them because that is money that you're not investing in their domain, that becomes problematic for them, right? Because all they make their money from is using your money, you know, making money off of money. And if you're using your money to not give your kid I don't look at the monies that I give my kid as just a wasted piece of dollar. It's an investment not only in my kid's future, not only in my kid's growing up well-being, even as it cause as it I have to do it more so than they did with me because of so the society we live in. It's an investment in family. And you know what? Uh in people have a tendency to believe that somehow not investing in you and you doing well and necessarily not helping those in the family that needs help that somehow then in your later years, oh, it's going to be okay because you have more money in your retirement because you have more money of your own. But you know what that leads to a society where as you grow old, you're thrown into a nursing home and not with the love of family, you know, uh, taking care of you because now it's all antiseptic. You saved a lot of money and you even saved enough to be in a nursing home. Most don't, most can't, but I mean, for those who can't, that's what the stock broker is telling you, you know, put your money away, give your money to that insurance company who can get you in a nursing home because they've used your money and now they're going to give some of it back to you to be in a nursing home. Whatever happened to family? Well, we never nurtured family. The economic system isn't designed to say, let's do the things that nurture family, that keeps, that makes families feel responsible for each other. Not only in youth, but in elder, uh, but when you get old, you wonder why today nursing homes are the big thing. And in the in the traditional American family, why is it that after one gets old and needs a little bit of help other than, yes, both host households are working. They folks throw their parents into a into a nursing home, et cetera. There, uh, without any feeling of I wish I could from some. It's the system that is keeping the families apart. A, a, a while back, somebody once said that, um, you know, our welfare system uh, destroys the family. And in a lot of ways, they were right. I mean, uh, w w uh, the people on welfare, they used to keep, they, they, they wanted you, you, the father to be out of the house because if the father is in the house, there's less, there's more money that's gotten. All these kinds of structures were created that, you know, that, that did this. And all of it was because of how much money one was willing to give under what circumstances we wanted to give the least possible. So what am I saying here? 
what am I trying to get across here? And I'm going to get a little bit more of the article, then I'll, I'll, I'll stay that. A recent survey from Bankrate found that 68% of parents are either supporting or have supported their adult in the past, adult children in the past, saying as a result, they delayed their own financial milestone. And I lo- believe in our, they look at that statement as a problem. I look at that statement as, as saying above and beyond the pressures from the the, the Wall Street folks telling you, don't, don't be giving those spoiled brats any money. You go ahead and throw it into your savings account. Look, I'm not saying to be irresponsible or to create irresponsible kids. But, I'm, but what I'm saying is whenever you hear the statement about giving money uh, first to the stockbroker before you help your kids or before you invest in your kids, I find it problematic. Now, Gen Z and millennials say on average, they shouldn't have to start pay off, paying off their bills until they're 22. Okay. Uh, most of us don't ever pay off our bills till we are 60 something. You doubt it? Take a look at the numbers. The data found millennials think that, I'm not going to read that part about the data think of what millennials is because it was clear that The author of this piece, however, had a severe bias against Gen Z and millennials. And I don't even consider it a bias other than it is something to make parents who decided to help their kids feel guilty because they want you to stop. They want your money. They want you invested in your retirement. And look, investing in your retirement, all these things are important. (laughs) That said, Large, most Americans right now can't even do that given our current economic state, uh, our permanent economic state, that is. Uh, then they want to give you illustrative examples now, right? Welcome aboard Eric Hayes to the program. They want to give you illustrative examples. So they have a subtitle in the article that says, helping my kids so much was a huge mistake. You know, the way these, I don't know if you remember yesterday, I Play, or two days ago, or I think it was on the Friday show, I said uh, my wife was watching a program on TV where it says that electric cars are heavier and because electric cars are heavier, the wrecks are going to be more substantial with the electric cars. And there's this just out of the blue story comes out, the networks pick it up and suddenly they put in the mind of people that somehow electric cars were dangerous, right? And I, after my wife kind of looked at me with concern, I said, hey, don't listen to that. The reality is uh, they're saying electric cars are heavier so that the wrecks could be more substantial. True mass and, you know, the mass, larger mass, that's what it gives to you. But you know what? Did they tell you that um, by not burning gas, there's less benzene in the air, et cetera, which for all those people who would have gotten cancer, which is quite a few of them, not just the people in a wreck that burning fuel in fossil cars and taking that car off the market saves more lives than that. Did they tell you that? Oh, no, I never thought about it that way. The same with this article. This article subliminally is teaching us something. When certain articles come out, we have to know the sources. We have to see where they come out and we have to understand why they are written. And when you see articles like this that are trying to promote, like I mentioned in the beginning of this program, a certain indoctrinative state a way of controlling your mind in a certain way. They're trying to tell you how you must behave, what you must do. They want to change your modal. When you look at the insular family who originated from certain countries, let's say China or other countries, a a, a Chinese family comes over here and that insular unit, I'm not talking about an Americanized Chinese family, but a Chinese family that comes over uh, and, and, and by the way, it's not only here in the United States. I'm from Panama, Central America. And when they migrate to Panama, the culture within that culture, they start, uh, they start a little store by going to different family members and they're putting their monies together. They're not going to Wall Street or a banker that is that. And I'm not I have nothing against a banker or Wall Street. Well, Wall Street, I do have a lot against, but a banker that is doing uh you know, uh, as the last resort, right? But 
they build their businesses from families they, in, in Panama, in Colón, where I'm from. You'd see a, a, a company come, a, a, a little store that sells a slice of bread, a piece of cheese, all these kinds of things for the worker who's just going off to breakfast. And they start that store little from a little bit of money is from their the family members and the kids get a little bit of money to go do this. And then slowly it, they build upon what the families together put together. And that culture, that culture is anathema to what we have in a lot of ways. Why? Because we don't want that. We don't want it to be that the, you raising money from the families around to, to build things because you cut out those, that small number of people who want to make money off of your money, right? If, if people start doing that and we start having a collective society where a group of friends get together and say, hey, you know what? Let's build this sort of stuff together. Hey, John is really good at that and he has this great idea. We are going to invest in John. Hey, you've just cut out the banking that the, the, you've just cut out that capitalist system that wants to use you as a piece of capital to generate a little bit of income for somebody else. That family that used to get together and say, you know what? Hey, auntie, brother, sister, uh, let, let's have this deal. All of us put X amount of dollars in a pie and work together or to put it more, no more local, invest in your kid who later on succeeds who later on know that they have a family that's backing them and gives them that much more self-worth, give them that much more uh, a feeling that they have a backing. And then when you get old, when you get old, because it's the unit, you know, you're not worried about, ah, you're going to be thrown in a, in a nursing home with no relationship to those kids. You know, my, my, uh, my, my, uh, my wife and I are watching uh, a, a newscast one time several years ago. And there's this woman uh, who, uh, you know, her house was in disrepair. She lived alone. The heat was gone, all of that. And the newscaster said, you know, and it's interesting. Her daughter is a doctor. Her uh, son is an engineer and all of that they were talking about. And, you know, this woman is living like this right and my wife was like look how lousy those kids are and you know initially i said yeah that's you know how do you let your mother your parent or any family member live that way when uh you're in this particular situation right and then i thought for a minute and i said you know people in general people are good and people are people are general reciprocative you know there must be something there and when you see stories like this one that I'm reading that seems so benevolent, but what it teaches you is to take care of you first, right? So that, do that, that kid that's a doctor now is thinking of taking care of themselves first. That kid that's an engineer is probably thinking about taking, them, taking care of themselves first, right? Uh, it, it, it is not, not of second nature because that parent that now needs probably took care of themselves first. I'm not saying I know that for a fact, but I'm saying knowing the goodness in people in, in, in the aggregate, you can see how that indoctrination of taking care of self first can be extrapolated. So I wanted to start off with this story because in effect, I'm saying, let's not let externalities, let not, let's not let a financial system, let's not let articles like this give you a second and, and if you are out there helping your kids because they're having a hard time if you're out there helping your kids because you know they they, they want to finish school and the, the, it's so expensive now and you decided to go into your 401k you decided to go into your retirement this article wants you to feel guilty about it don't take your money away from the stock brokers we need your money to make money uh do not feel bad or a, a, a bad feeling for doing what is the right thing to do. You may not have a million dollars when you retire, but you'll have the love of your kid. You will have a kid that you've invested in. You would have the things that matter. And you know what matters? Human relationships more than any piece of dollar matters. It does matter.
It does matter. Like I said, my, the goal here is not about spoiling kids. That's not what I'm talking about. The goal here is not about saying kids can have and do as they please. The, the, the thing here is, I remember riding the bike with, uh, when I used to ride with, with a club here in, in Kingwood, and a guy, the two of us were <clears throat> pulling the back up, and the two of us were riding side by side, and he said, my son is getting ready for college, and this guy's an executive. And he's like, I told him, my parents gave me nothing to go to school, and I'm giving him nothing to go to school. He better get himself a job and take care of, you know, that, that individualistic kind of a being, right? And as I'm riding my bike, I'm like, my God, my God, I could never do that for my daughter. You know, I had my daughter at 529 when she was going to school, and as she did more schooling than I thought she would in, in, in going to med school and all of that. The answer to you, Eric, is yes, I did use my retirement to help my kid. And do I regret any of that? Absolutely not. That was an investment in my kid's future. And uh, that was definitely an investment in her future. And I would do it over and over again. I would rather not have a whole ton of money in the bank, having known that I helped a part of our family unit move ahead. This thing that they teach you about. Oh, uh, 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 Bridge is right about putting the mask on yourself first so that you can save the kid. But when it comes to investing in a kid, it's investing in a kid so that the future can go on. Because if you don't invest in that kid when it is time to invest in that kid, under the, the, under the theory that you are putting your money away for the future, number one, you don't know what the future holds. That's the first thing. You don't know what the future holds. But you know that if your kid doesn't get that investment in the present, that you may crush their ability. Wealthy people, you know, I, I, I was talking to, to somebody on the side about this subject, and he said, you know, imagine it's a wealthy people telling the middle class, don't invest in your kids, invest in, in the stock market first, invest in your retirement first. But he said, interestingly, the first thing they do is they put their kids into high quality schools and make sure that their kids are ready to take the realm. But they don't want you to do that. They don't want you to do that. Well, no, I believe in investing in kids. And I, like I said, from the, the people, the, from the people from other cultures that come here, you see that for them, family is first. They take care of family. They work within the family unit and the family unit works for them all. Anyhow, Second subject of the day, Mr. Liu, Ted Liu, really brought to the forefront. Yes, there was Russian collusion right now. The right wing is trying to reinvent history that somehow there was no Russian collusion in the election of 2016. I repeat, there was Russian collusion, and that is what not only that is what the 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 uh, report said, the the, uh, the Miller, Mueller report. Don't let them fool you unless you're foolable check this out we'll take it on the other side the right wing tries to chip away at the truth until they have sculpted a lie into stone they tried to do it the 2020 election they've really tried to do it and had some success with covid lockdowns oh they were a failure oh they were necessary and they have tried to do it and had some success with the Mueller investigation into russian sabotage of the 2016 election as part of that effort, the House Judiciary Committee heard testimony from, as we mentioned, John Durham this morning, the special counsel appointed under Donald Trump to investigate the people who tried to investigate what Russia did in that election. But Congressman Ted Lieu, Democrat of California, was having none of it. Okay. Now, Mr. Durham, Durham I'd like to ask you the following simple yes or no questions. Trump's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, was convicted, correct? That's correct. Not Trump's former foreign policy questions. advisor to the campaign, George Papadopoulos, was convicted, correct? That's correct. Trump's former deputy campaign manager, Rick Gates, was convicted, correct? Not in connection with okay. Russia. Trump's. Matter. All right. Mr. Durham, you can hold yourself out as an objective Department of Justice official or as a partisan hack. And the more that you try to spin the facts and not answer my questions, you sound like the latter. So I'm just going to ask this. Simply, Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, was convicted, correct? That's correct. Trump's longtime advisor, Roger Stone, was convicted, correct? Correct. In contrast to multiple Trump associates who were convicted, you brought two cases of jury trial based on this investigation, and you lost both. And so I don't actually know what we're doing here, because the author of the Durham report concedes 
that the FBI had enough information to investigate. And thank goodness the FBI did because multiple Trump associates who committed crimes were held accountable. And the best way to summarize what happened is thank you to the brave men and women of the FBI for doing their job. Um, Congressman, what, what was your understanding of the purpose of today's hearing, Mr. Durham? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chris, for your question. Let me first say, when Democrats control the House, we pass laws like the infrastructure law to help American families grow our economy. And when Republicans control, what do we get? We get stupid stuff like this dumb hearing on a Durham report, which concluded after wasting $6 million of taxpayers' money, that the FBI had a duty to investigate allegations of trump russia collusion. And thank goodness the FBI did that because multiple Trump associates were convicted and held accountable for their crimes. One of the, the themes today was frustration from Republicans, right? Yeah. The, the, the Durham's investigation, his report, and the two cases he brought, which you referenced, both of which uh, ended in acquittals, quite notably, uh, didn't come up with more. Matt Gates tweeting Durham is part of the cover-up and then uh, telling Durham to his face he was like the Washington generals. Uh, take a look at this, this exchange. You didn't charge Andrew McCabe. You didn't convict the lion Democrats or the lion Russians. You didn't investigate Mifsud or the Mueller probe, even though, as we sit here today in black letter, that was your charge. Have you ever heard of the Washington generals? Uh, the Washington generals? Yes. Yeah. And, and they're the team that basically gets paid to show up and lose, right? <laughs> um, what do you take away from the frustration of folks like Gates and others with Durham and what Durham produced? Yeah. MAGA Republicans are trying to rewrite history and we cannot let them. The facts are very clear. The Department of Justice, through the Mueller report, found that the Russians interfered in our elections in 2016 in a sweeping and systematic fashion. A bipartisan U.S. Senate report in 2020 concluded the Russians interfered and it was designed to benefit Donald Trump. And then Paul Manafort, Trump's campaign chairman, admitted that he gave internal Trump campaign data to the Russians. Uh, that is called Russian collusion. We, that is definitely called Russian collusion. And that is what the, that is what the Mueller report said. What Barr did, that's why even as Barr is coming out against Trump right now, we have to remember that Barr was complicit in all that occurred. Anyway, Big Pharma is at it again. Big Pharma is at it again. What are they doing? They are suing. A consortium of them are suing. I want you to listen to this. I did this piece this morning as well at KPFT. Check this out. Second topic, it has to do with big pharma. And I, it, it irks me that this doesn't get more, more play. Uh, the, the title of the, 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 this particular, the title of this particular piece that, you know, that I drug out of common dreams last night was no surprise, big pharma sues Biden over effort to lower drug prices for Americans. And if you notice, remember last week I spoke about Merck and Merck suing the government. Well, that was not enough. You know, that wasn't enough. They want to cripple. They want to cripple the ability of your government, our government. They want to cripple it before it gets started because they are scared about that that stone rolling down the hill, that little snowball rolling down the hill and becoming pretty, pretty big, right? So it's no surprise that big pharmaceuticals vote them. Here it goes. It says, aiming to protect wealthy pharmaceutical companies from any reduction in their tens of billions of dollars in annual profits or lavish CEO compensation packages, the industry's biggest lobbying group on Wednesday announced a lawsuit against the Biden administration over its policy allowing Medicare to negotiate lower drug prices for consumers. Part of the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed last year, the Medicare negotiation provision has been a key demand of progressives, including Senator Bernie Sanders for several years as the United States pays more per person for prescribed drugs than, they, than 
any other country and nearly a third of Americans said in one survey last year that they have avoided taking medications due to costs. So if folks are taking medication, like not taking their medication due to cost, that means that a certain percentage of those folks will get sicker and yet another percentage of those will die. So therefore, I think there's a direct correlation between the pharmaceutical companies and unnecessary illness and unnecessary debts. Before I proceed with the article, ask yourself a question. They are suing the United States government for wanting to negotiate prices for drugs. Maybe it is time for us to have a class action lawsuit against the drug industry, against pharmaceutical companies under the premise that they are affecting the illnesses and murder of our citizens by their policies. You know, I am in several organizations, other organizations, and, you know, every so often these organizations get sued, right? Uh, these are these benevolent organizations, these nonprofit people have disagreements and they decide to sue each other or whatever. And I always say for the one who knows that they are in the right, you know, it is time to be aggressive and aggressive means immediately, immediately counter suing when you have things like this. I think we could create good grounds for suing a company who, who, is, who has developed products based on money you, the taxpayer, has paid to universities and, and the NIH and other departments uh, to develop these drugs. And after these drugs are developed, these companies try to charge you again exorbitant amounts, exorbitant amounts, to use these drugs, and because we, the people who've already paid for these drugs, can't afford it, we get sick, some of us die. I think it is time for us to sue those companies civilly and criminally. I mean, if we know death could occur, that could also, we could probably find a good lawyer who could say that is premeditated murder. Wishful thinking on my part, but you know what? Aggressive thinking, it's what we are going to need if we are going to bring some benevolency back into this society. But we can take that another time. Although, back to the article, although a Congressional Budget Office analysis found last year that allowing Medicare to negotiate lower drug prices would save the U.S. nearly $290 billion in new revenue and savings over a decade, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America on Wednesday became the latest pro-industry group to sue over the provision, arguing the law is unconstitutional. Wow. Wow. It's unconstitutional. I want people to understand what this is saying here. They are saying it is unconstitutional for our government. We, the people, it's unconstitutional. They're claiming to negotiate for better prices for all of us who are paying the bill for these drugs, but not only that are paying the bill, that wants to pay the bill to get these drugs, but also paid the bill to develop these drugs. They're suing us. I mean, you know, I know a lot of you have heard the frog story. The frog story is that if you put a frog in water and you start put some heat into that water because, and you gradually heat that water, as that water is heated because the, the change in temperature over time is so small. By the time that water starts to boil, that frog is so used to it that it dies being boiled because, again, the delta change was so little that it was imperceptible. Is that a true story or is that truly how it works? I don't, I, you know, from, you know, I, I, look, when I get into the shower and as I progressively get the water, uh, eventually it reaches a point that you want to. But again, you, you, you get the gist. The gist is that 
these guys have been doing wrong, Delta wrongs for so long. In other words, I get a little bit worse every year. We, we, we take, we push it to the limit every time a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. So much so that when we are at a maximal level of evil, like these drug companies are right now, when you reach that maximal level of evil to you, it doesn't even seem all that evil that you are suing a government trying to make drugs affordable to people so that they don't die. Ultimately, that's what it is. So that they don't die, they're selling, they're, they're putting these products out. They're trying to negotiate the price of these products in which, of which these guys are saying, no, it is unconstitutional. And you mean... We didn't make this didn't make big news yesterday or the day before, etc. on our news channels. It didn't make it didn't make that. It's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, but anyhow, anyhow, here's the deal. Continuing with the article. Because just reading it is frustrating. But Forma argued in a court filing in the Western District of Texas. I notice where they wanted to file that case, right? In the Western District of Texas, that the provision violates the constitutional requirement for checks and balances by placing too much authority in the hands of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the due process clause by denying drug companies input regarding pricing and the Eighth Amendment ban on excessive fines due to the excise tax big pharma companies will be required to pay if they refuse to negotiate. All right. So the Biden administration is saying negotiate for the prices. And if you don't negotiate for these prices, there will be an excise tax, right? And why an excise tax? Well, of course, there's an excise tax. I mean, uh, you, you know, we, we paid for these drugs. We paid to develop these drugs. So, you know, you don't negotiate, you know, again, we have the right to tax. So they're saying, no, 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 no. You have, we don't, we want, we want the drug companies. We want, while you're negotiating prices, we want to have input in what those pricing conditions are going to be. Okay, really? I mean, the, 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 the idea, the idea that they are serious about this makes one wonder. Again, like I said, uh, the frog metaphor. <laughs> Holy City says you completely destroyed the boiling a frog metaphor. I don't, I, I don't know that I did. Maybe my words didn't come out as clean as they should, but the idea is a Delta temperature is what makes the frog boil. I mean, uh, it's staying there to the boiling point, my friend. So I think that is accurate. All right. The Senate finance committee chairman, Ron Wyden said it was no surprise that pharmaceutical companies want to stop the Medicare from saving millions of senior citizens out-of-pocket costs and warn that they'll likely be successful if a Republican candidate wins the presidency in 2024. I expect the Biden administration to vigorously defend Medicare's bargaining power so seniors will see the lower drug prices they expect, said Wyden. This legal action underscores how critical it is to have a president in the White House who will fight for lower uh, health costs for Americans. I have deep concerns that a Republican administration would roll out the red carpet for big pharma and once again ban Medicare from negotiating lower drug prices. Lower drug prices. Uh, Pharma was joined by the National Infusion Center Association and the Global Colon Cancer Association in legal challenge, which follows a lawsuit filed by drug maker Merck, right? Uh, 
earlier this month, which is the one that I, we spoke about a few weeks ago or a week ago. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce and Bristol Myers Squibb have also sued over the provision this month with the latter claiming as Pharma did Wednesday that the law is bad for innovation. All right. The law is bad for innovation. I'm glad that they said that. Now the lawyers for the government can really go into where innovation actually comes from. When they say it's bad for innovation, what they're saying, brothers and sisters, is the following. If we are not allowed to charge you exorbitant prices for the drugs that we sell, we will not have innovation because we need all those profits to innovate. I, it, it amused me also that a part of that consortium suing the government is the Global Colon Cancer Association. Because anybody who watches TV, anybody who watches TV every single day, whether it be uh, the, the broadcast or cable news, etc., you know, there's this new colon drug, I mean, this new colon test on the market. You can go ahead and without a colonoscopy, now you can actually determine if you have a colon cancer by simply doing this in-home test, right? And every other, every half hour or so, this, I'm not going to name the drug, on, I'm not going to name the test or anything here, but every, every few minutes, in between the breaks, you hear this colon advertising come on. Where the hell is all that money to keep advertising a test? If you go to your doctor, your doctor should tell you, hey, you need this test. You need that test. You don't need for our the monies that we are going to pay for these tests and these drugs to be advertised on TV ad nauseum. We don't need to have these advertising over and over again because that is money that's you're paying for. Every single ad that you see on TV for medicine, every single ad on TV that you see for a test, when you hear them say, go uh, ask your doctor about this test, ask your doctor about this medication, those, those ads cost tens of thousands of dollars to put on on ABC, CBS, MSNBC, and all of that. Every time they air, thousands of dollars to air that ad. And to pay for that ad, the expectation is more people are going to use that thing and that they're going to charge you that amount of more money for the medicine, et cetera, as opposed to just letting the doctor know about the medicine and saying the doctor makes the best option for that. But now they want to use it as, a, as an excuse. Oh my God, it is going to, it is going to somehow charge you. It, 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 it is going to stop innovation. If we do that, if we come and try to do that. So I want all of you to realize it's a sham. It is a complete sham. This drug issue, this drug suit that it's going on right now, that they are going to sue you or that they're going to sue. Yeah, they're suing you. They're suing the government. We, the people, are getting sued by big pharma because they want to be able to exploit you. And when they talk about innovation, they need to make all this money so they can create newer drugs. <laughs> They don't innovate. I repeat, I'm going to throw this back in a minute, but they don't innovate. The innovation comes, the genesis of innovation, the start of innovation in the, in the pharmaceutical field starts at your university and from grants that the NIH, the government institution, give to companies. And the reason why is companies do not take risks. Companies do not take risks. So please, my brothers and my sisters, this is a big story, bigger than the media is talking about. And the media doesn't want to talk about it because they love those Merck commercials. They love those colon, colonoscopy commercials, et cetera, et cetera, that you are paying for with those high prices. They spend more money. They spend more money on advertising, executive pay, and uh, and shareholder dividends and value than they do on research and development. So that is a lie right within there. And I hope the Biden administration, 
actually calls them out on that with the proof that's out there for all of us to see that these drug companies spend their money on ads, spend their money on giving high, high, high salaries to executives and spend their money on giving high returns to investors. Please, please. This is a huge story. Yes, it is a huge story. Uh, Bridge, there is your, uh, there is your meme Shocking things liberals believe. But before I get into reading your meme, uh, I want to address Paul. Paul, I'm sorry about that that cost that you're talking about. It's a shame. It's a sham that your drug that we likely developed is costing you that much. Um, I would love to uh, have you, if if you're comfortable, uh, to do a one-on-one -on -one, an interview with you as far as what you're going through and your medical, uh, so that we can show in real in real to what it is for real people out there, our lousy medical system. So if you're willing to do so, drop me a direct message, please, my brother, because I would love to hear your story. And and we, you know, we are here on your side. And I, I've seen, um, uh, I have a wife with lupus which is a disease where the immune system attack, 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 attack your own body, uh, which is similar to many other autoimmune diseases. So I would love if you, uh, at any time, if you'd like to go, go through with that. Great conversation going on there. Thank you very much, John Cotter, for, telling, for not allowing the fallacies from our brother, Michael Cisak, to get, uh, get go unanswered. It is important that we answer every fallacy, every false prophet, every false bit of information. All right. People work, uh, shocking things liberals believe. People working 40 hours a week should not live in poverty. CEOs should not receive 3,000 times the pay of their workers. Wall Street gangsters should go to prison when they steal. No child should ever have to worry about being shot at school. No one, especially veterans, should be homeless. There should not be subsidies for profitable corporations. Equal rights and equal pay should be the benchmark for all Americans. Politicians should not dictate medical decisions for women. Lobbyists should not be allowed to bribe our representatives. Companies should not be permitted to trash the earth for profit. Healthcare should be given to all, not be a luxury for rich people. Everyone should have access to higher education. For our conservatives in the house, for our right-wing brothers and sisters, which one of those policies do you disagree with? Which ones of those policies do you want to not become effective for us all? Let us know. Because if you believe in all those things as well, then suddenly... You may not be as conservative as you think you are. You may not be as conservatives as you think you are. Great find, uh, Bridge MCP. All those items that you put there, Bridge, poll at over 60%. They all poll at over 60%, some 70, some 80. That's what we're talking about, Bridge. Anyhow, uh, Paul, get in touch with me, please, if you can. You, you know how to reach me directly. I uh, want to tell everybody thank you so kindly for uh, thank you so kindly for going ahead and listening to our, our program. Please remember to share it. This is how we are going to get the message out. Uh, Kathy Pascual says, please send a link to YouTube live. Thank you. We'll do, uh, we'll do send you the link to YouTube Live. Actually, here is how you get it. Um, and Kathy is here. HTTP, let's give it to you right now. Politics done right TV. There it is, my dear. Politics done right TV. Politics done right TV. Eric, 60% uh, isn't 100%, but 60% is a large majority. And the others are people that are even, either that delusional, wealthy, or selfish. Anyhow, um, let, let's uh, got to get to close the program right now. I want to thank everybody for listening. Please, again, share the program. This is how we are going to get things done. This is how we will get things done. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. And you guys know how I end this, baby. I am what? 
out. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.